I live in Alberta, Canada. This story takes place in June of 2015. I was 28 years old and my fiancé was 32. I'll call him K for the story. It was going to be a very hot day, for we had just purchased our first car after years of taking public transit and decided to go for an overnight trip to Jasper Park. To anyone who doesn't know, Jasper Park is a beautiful stretch of highway that runs through the foothills into the Rockies right around there. I'm not sure what it is like in other countries, but here in the parks and wooded areas it's not uncommon for people to pull off on the side of the highway and hike into areas for day trips or even to camp to avoid the overcrowded campgrounds. We had been on the road for about four hours and I was starting to feel cramped when we came to an area with a beautiful glacier river running next to the highway. So we decided to pull off the road onto an old maintenance road that ran down what we thought was the train tracks that ran parallel to the road. The road was extremely overgrown and had railroad ties sticking up vertically about two feet out of the ground in an attempt to block the road permanently, but they were spaced apart far enough for a very small vehicle to get through. Well, our new car happened to be one of those tiny economy class cars, so we decided to try and fit past the barrier. So Kay got out and directed me through the small opening in between the posts, and to my surprise, we fit. He decided it would be best for him to walk in front of me and lead me through the overgrown path while I crept the car forward in case there were any rocks or stumps that could damage the very low undercarriage of our new car. After about 15 feet into the road, the grass suddenly became taller than my car and the trees thick and brushing against the roof and the path was dark with light at the end that indicated a clearing. Basically, it looked like something out of one of those really corny camping horror movies, but we decided to go forward and came upon a clear-cut line. These lines are cut out by the government as surveyors and gas lines. Anyways, we went about 50 feet into the clearing that was surrounded by thick trees on all sides. After finding a flattish area where we could set up a makeshift camp, Kay decided to go and try to find where the river ran closest so we could go stick our feet in and cool down. I voiced concerned about the bears in the area and wanted to keep the bear spray with me, so he took his wood axe with him. Side note, people don't have guns other than hunting rifles due to our gun laws, and due to this we didn't have anything other than bear spray, pocket knives, and an axe for potential defense. I decided to start digging out our tent to look for a spot to set it up for the night. Kay was gone for about five minutes when I heard what looked like another vehicle close by. I didn't think anything of it at the time, thinking who else could possibly fit the car through there. So I brushed it off and continued what I was doing, but at the same time moved my can of bear spray out of the backpack to just inside of my trunk where I could grab it in a matter of seconds, just in case. After another minute or so, I just happened to look in the direction of the road that led us into the clearing, and to my surprise, I see a man walking towards me. He looked to be about 35 to 40 years old with a ball cap and dirty blue reflective coveralls on. You know the ones you see the oil rig guys wear. After the complete shock of seeing someone, I started to notice I could not see his face that well, but he had on a ball cap and shades with a scruffy beard. He was walking directly towards me with his hands in his pockets. I started to panic a little and immediately called out for Kay and for him to get back here. I hear him yell something, but I refuse to take my eyes off the stranger who is now less than 20 feet away from me. Now I should mention that the area is known for hunting, but it was not the season. He reaches me and stops about 5 feet away, and me being the friendly person I am, I smile and say, Hi, uh, didn't expect to see anyone here. He looks at me from head to toe and stands there for what feels like forever and says, Um... Hello, what brings you here? His tone very blank and not giving anything away. I say, um, my fiancé and I were just looking for a place to pop the tent for the night. He freezes at the mention of my fiancé. He looks around as he hears Kay coming through the woods to the right of us. The stranger still gawking at me does not move as Kay comes out of the tree line with his axe propped up on his shoulder. Kay looks at me and then the stranger and immediately speed walks to my side, and being the cautious, overly protective guy he is, says, Hey man, is there something I can help you with? 
No, just checking my trail cams. The guy then looks at Kay assessing him and glaring at his axe. I ask him, Oh, so you know the area. Do you know if it's okay for us to camp here for the night? He looks directly at me and says, Yeah, as long as you don't have a fire or anything, and once in a while service trucks come down here to survey. I respond, "Uh, Thanks for the heads up. He will not stop looking at me at this point. Kay sees this and decides he had had it enough and says again, Is there something you needed? The guy finally stops looking at me long enough to answer. I was in here checking my trail cams and got a flat on my jeep. He indicates the bumper of his jeep that is just visible through the brush. He continues, I tried to change my spare but I have custom wheels and can't get the nuts off with the tools I have. Now everyone in Alberta knows that guys with custom trucks or go off-roading always carry the proper tools. Alarm number one. Kay and I walk closer to get a better view of his vehicle and note that it is one of those jacked up off-road jeeps with the engine snorkel and everything. I remember the alarms going off in my head yelling at me that this is weird. Even I carry tools needed to switch out my tires. At this point, I notice his jeep is blocking the only entrance into the clearing. I proceed to say, Um, sorry, but as you can tell, I only have a small car, and my tire iron is only big enough to fit the nuts for my 15-inch wheels in my car. I don't think we'll be able to help you. The guy starts to look annoyed as Kay and I start to move back to our car. The guy follows us back to our car, then says, well, could she possibly give me a lift to Jasper to get help? I immediately start to panic and say, Well, m- my car is packed to the roof with camping gear. I'm one of those overpackers that has something for every situation. I'm not unloading all my stuff and leaving it here in the woods. The guy starts to get agitated, shifting back and forth in place. He then says, It'll only be a couple of hours and... Your fiancé can stay here with your stuff then. I'm about to say no when Kay says very plainly, I'm not letting her drive alone with you and leave me here in the woods. The guy looks at Kay and says, Please, I I just need a ride into town or at least to somewhere where I can get cell reception. Note, there is no reception in most of Jasper Park unless you have a booster or a satellite phone. Even then, it's patchy service, and the closest town is Jasper itself, which at this point was two hours away. He continues to try to get me to drive him by myself for another five minutes before we both get visibly irritated. Kay then says as calmly as he can, Sorry man, you're going to have to walk out to the road and hail someone down. Now the guy is mad and takes one last look at me and then turns around and walks towards the road. After he's out of sight, I immediately pack up the car and start to turn around and head for the clearing entrance. As we pull up to where his jeep is blocking the access to the road, both Kay and I get out and investigate his jeep. He didn't have a flat. There was nothing wrong with his jeep at all. Kay decides to look in the back seat through the tinted windows. He all of a sudden panics and says we need to get out of here. I don't question him and get in the driver's seat while Kay takes his axe and clears away the brush on the side where his jeep is blocking the exit. After about ten minutes of pulling weeds, branches, and rocks, we make a space big enough to creep through. It takes us an additional five minutes to creep through the overgrown access back out to the highway. As we're pulling onto the highway, we can see the creep down a ways hitchhiking. Kay says just drive in the opposite direction. So we drive for about 15 minutes and decide to double back and see if he's still there. As we come up to an access again, we notice he is no longer on the side of the road. So we pull into the access road again where the makeshift barrier was and immediately notice his jeep is gone. Kay freaks out and we back out of there and drive 45 minutes up the highway to a new spot. We find a nice calm area directly next to the highway where we can access the river. We hang out for a couple of hours while all the time keeping an eye out for the creepy guy. We kept hearing twigs snapping behind us in the overgrowth, 
but due to the events that day decided to err on the side of caution and not go investigate. I finally start to relax a little bit and just enjoy the sweltering heat. Around 6 p.m., it was starting to get dark because of the mountains blocking the sun, so Kay decides it's time to pack up and leave. I remind him that I had a couple of beers while sitting at the river, so I needed a nap before we could go anywhere. He agrees, and we go and sit in the car, which we had parked on a little makeshift rest area. We hunker down, and I try to doze off. Suddenly, Kay jerks up and says, Did you hear that? I'm still somewhat groggily from just passing out, respond. No, what's going on? Quiet, quiet. But this time it's pitch black all around us. All of a sudden I hear it. The crunch of gravel and twigs as if someone is walking in wide circles around us. We looked at each other and then hear it again, this time closer to the front of the car. I squint as hard as I can and then immediately turn the key and turn on the lights. To our surprise, there is no one there. Without saying anything, I decided that I had rested enough and my adrenaline was coursing through me. I turned the engine over and threw the car into reverse and headed back down the highway towards home. After about 20 minutes of nerve-wrenching silence and constantly checking our mirrors to see if anyone was following us, I break the silence and ask the question that has been bugging me. So now that we're out of there... What was in the back seat of his jeep that made you freak out so bad? Kay looks at me, worry etched on his face, not normal for him at all. Takes a deep breath and says, It's hard to see due to the tent, but I can make out a hunting rifle, which is not out of the ordinary here, but most disturbing was a roll of duct tape, rope, and a tarp. After seeing that, Kay freaked out, realizing this guy wanted more than just a ride from us. I switched up my career in healthcare to follow my dream of learning to work on cars. I was hired this past May at a dealership as a quick service mechanic and fell in love immediately with everything about it and my co-workers. I noticed how cute my trainer was. Not only was he cute, he was very patient with training me. I was so new to working on cars I needed to learn the basics and he was so cute and nice about everything. I'll call him Nick. He was 40 years old, male. Me and Nick had hit it off in every way. He asked me on our first date to go geocaching. Swoon. Nick and I had been side by side since then. I loved everyone I worked with always laughing and playing pranks on each other, but also always helping each other and busting our butts to make the customers happy. I should add that my best friend works there, and another good friend of ours had gotten hired too. We were a close-knit family in the quick service department. Well, I didn't make it past my probationary period because I was just a bit slower, so Nick has a full mechanic garage at his dad's place and I'd meet him after he got off of work so we could make some side job money. So about a month and a half ago, Nick and I decided to get an apartment together, and it's been amazing. I've been bringing him to work, grabbing him on lunch break, and picking him up, which I love because I can also say hey to all of my old co-workers. That being said, I should add that Nick doesn't have any social media, and we are together literally all the time, except when he's working. And here's where things get crazy. I get a message request on Facebook from some random girl saying, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Nick is my man, and he's in your profile photo with you. He's been my man for seven months. I immediately went into panic mode, called him at work asking who this girl is, and he was just as confused. The more I talked to this girl to try and figure out what is going on, the more she said weirdly specific things about Nick like the truck he drives, They met at his dad's shop, which no one would know about his dad's shop because he never talks about it. She knew his phone number and everything, but she could never provide proof. Screenshot conversations, photos of the two of them, nothing. We got to a point where it felt like this whole thing was real and that her and I are going to team up, but she never answered my calls, only messages. But after Nick and I had a huge talk about it, I knew that something wasn't right about this girl. I had to get to the bottom of it. 
I started getting pretty scared when one day I dropped Nick off after lunch. A minute went by and I get a message saying, Dang, Nick looks sexy in that hoodie today. This shook me up. I asked what color and she said the correct color. At this point, my first thought is, stalker, like actually watching us. I told Nick about how she knew what he was wearing and he was super creeped out. Then when I pick him up, I usually park by the quiet side of the building where no one really can see me. This time though, a work truck drives by me really slowly. I pretend not to notice him because I was in no mood to chat with anyone, and I recognize the driver as a former co-worker of mine that I'd only spoken to maybe two times during my time at the dealership, however we were friends on Facebook. Within a minute of him passing me by, the girlfriend messages me saying, you're waiting for Nick on the other side of the building right now. In that moment I started to freak out. This dude is pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. Then after talking to Nick about it, yeah, he's the only one from work that knew Nick's dad had a shop. Nick had worked on this guy's truck before. They aren't friends, but they do chat here and there. Well, not anymore. But I just don't know why. Why was he saying such gross things to me as he was pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend? If he's capable of doing this, who knows what else he's capable of. He's also a giant dude in his 40s with children of his own. I have no actual proof other than the fact that any time this girl was active, so was he. I see this dude every day, and Nick still works with him. He's in a different department than Nick, thank God. So yeah, still not sure what to do about this. A crazy former coworker pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend to get us to break up or something weird. I guess I'll see you tomorrow. Unfortunately. I'm a 14 year old boy from the UK and this event happened to me about three weeks ago. So being a teenager, my friend, who I'll refer to as Jay, wanted to sneak out and meet up with one of our other friends, both girls, who I'll refer to as A and H. So on Friday night, I went and stayed at Jay's house as we'd snuck out before and his house is relatively easy to sneak out from. So night comes and Jay's parents send us to bed at around 10pm and we stay quiet until about midnight when we know Jay's parents are asleep. We then proceed to slowly open his bedroom door, down the stairs and out the back door, where we use the side gate to escape. Now Jay's house is a short walk from the town center, which we have to go through in order to get to A's house, where we are meeting A and H. Being a Friday night, the town center was alive with clubs and rowdy drunks looking for a good time. Nothing extraordinary happened on our trek through town, barring a couple of drunks approaching us and slurring utter nonsense. Then we were approached by a fairly good-looking lady, trying to entice us into a local strip club, which we both found hilarious. Finally, after a 30-minute walk in the cold and dark, we finally reached A's house. We spotted A and H climbing out a window trying to be as stealthy as possible, which we also giggled at. Finally, they escaped and we headed back towards the town center in search of 24-hour fried chicken shops. About halfway there, we spotted a hooded man lingering at the entrance of a tunnel that we had to go through. We didn't trust this, so we crossed the road to the opposite side of the loiterer. Then, out of nowhere, another hooded bloke popped out from an alleyway and called out to the initial hooded bloke, who started to walk over to him. The second man, who had popped out, asked if we had any illicit substances. We did our best to ignore him, apart from H, ever the loudmouth who told him some guy called Peter could get him some. He replied with something unsavory as we entered the tunnel. We scolded H and continued walking, giggling and chatting. Then as me and A go on ahead, we hear J shout, Oi! He's chasing us! We turn simultaneously and see the original hooded guy giving chase about a hundred feet behind. We turn and run for our lives, adrenaline pumping through our veins. We come to a split in the road and shoot left down a dark street. Everyone else continues running. I'm convinced we have lost him, so I stop to take a puff of my inhaler. 
I turn to check and see the guy about 50 feet back gunning for me. Oh no, I think, and run, falling as I hop the curb. I return to my feet in record time, soon catching up with the group, panning for dear life. We take a sharp turn in a park or field and run quickly to the other side. From where he was, we would have been invisible to him, but from where we were, we could see him pacing past the local park looking frantically in. I wheeze and we all stop. Then, we look up and see him enter the park and the chase resumed and, in the darkness, I smack into a low-hanging branch and almost stack it, my inhaler plummeting into the dirt. I make a grab for it and catch up with the rest of the group as we stop, finally having lost him. We make it back to A's house where me and Jay ordered a cab and say goodbye. As we were in the cab and reached the end of A's road, we see out of the tinted windows our chaser, wielding a large knife looking frantically around, probably looking for us. We make it home and inform A and H of what we had seen and crash to bed. All I can say is that this was the first time I had truly been scared, and to this day, I have chilled at the thought of sneaking out again. It all started when I got my first computer. I was beginning to start showing some responsibility so my parents got me a red Acer. Reminder, I was still very young. I was taught about stranger danger and all that, but I never thought anyone on the internet would try to do me harm. This all changed when I found the website, Hot Games for Girls. Basically in those days, it was a much bigger website with all different types of chat rooms, different topics, groups, and my favorite that I had never experienced before, video calls. I recently got on to check to see if there had been any changes and luckily they removed all chat rooms and from what I can tell the ability to make individual profiles as well. I remember I was wearing a green tank top with stars on the right top side and loose shorts. It was a weekend and I really wanted to meet people. As an introvert this is obviously very hard in real life especially when you have anxiety. I join a public chat room. It was normal for the most part, teens joking around, talking about topics they were interested in and me trying to fit in. I got a request from a username that is far gone from my memories now, but for this story I'll call him Anon1. I clicked on it, curious to see what they had said. We had started talking, telling each other how our days were, how old we were. He said he was a 14 year old boy that wanted to video chat. Now, as I was a self-conscious little girl, I said no because I was kind of confused on why a 14-year-old would want to talk to me. He slowly convinced me to call, though. When I did, I vividly remember the black screen on the left side and me sitting on my bed on the right. I remember saying hello, with no one saying anything back. I was about to leave when I had a message pop up. Can't talk. Mic's broke. You are very beautiful. I obviously like this comment, as gross as it might seem to me today, fully understanding the severity of the situation. The call was going good until he asked me to lift my shirt. I had started stuttering and got really nervous as he kept calling me beautiful and I should share with him. I'm so glad I didn't. After I said no for like the fifth time, he got angry with me, saying he was going to find me, hurt me and other explicit things. Now he knew my name and the state I lived in. As soon as that was said, I slammed my laptop and put it in my closet under a ton of blankets. Please, watch your children's sights. No matter how safe they may seem, people can and will find loopholes to fulfill their disgusting needs and desires. This happened in 2015 when my husband and I were together. We've since separated and perhaps this story will help you understand why. He and I married that year and he always was a little off, sometimes more off than on. He served in the military and was proud of his time served and I was proud of him too. However, he had a tendency towards visual hallucinations. I'm not sure if it's the PTSD or his familial history of mental illness but 
He saw things. Usually it happened while driving. Once he saw an eight-foot spider casing the side of the barn while we were riding along the road. He asked me if I saw it. He was panicking. I didn't see it. Let me paint a picture. My mom lives deep, deep in the rural south. Further down her road are old houses people still live in and use outhouses to this day. They collect rainwater to drink, etc. Before you get to my mom's road, there's a well-kept farmhouse pretty close to the main highway. A highway with its own, um, haunted issues. Ghost cars and such. I'm not kidding. My sister says she's seen a dozen men walking out in the fields behind that house, dressed immaculately in white suits. I promise everything I'm saying is true to the best of my knowledge. He and I pull onto the highway one night after dusk and are gaining speed as we pass that house. He's driving and I'm in the passenger side, head back, eyes closed, and the farmhouse is on the right of the car. Suddenly my husband swerves and screams, my eyes open. In a blur I see a white human-shaped creature running at the car. Pale white, maybe gray skin, crazed, angry eyes. I don't recall that it was wearing clothing, I just remember the flash of white skin and those eyes. Human eyes, unmistakably human with all the rage and wild contempt that only a human being could be capable of. It was running right from my door, but we passed it before it made it to the car. He screamed, asked if I had seen it. I don't know why, I can't tell you why, but I told him I hadn't. He described it to me and I reiterated that I hadn't seen it. Later on I confessed that I had seen it, so I'm not a complete liar, I hope. I can't let go of the feeling that it wanted to do harm to one of us. It seems I had locked eyes with it, but it was only a split second so I wonder what my mind had filled in to make sense of the situation. Worse, much more strange things happened to my husband and me, but I can't talk about those things. I feel safe enough describing this, however. For some reason, he seemed like a beacon for the unusual and the unexplainable. He and I separated due largely to his decreasing mental health, but I'm not so sure what he's been seeing these days. But I know we both saw something that night. I'm just not sure what it was. I was about 7 or 8 years old at the time. I only vaguely remember this because I'm 18 now. My grandma and I went to town to go and buy something at this clothing store around the corner from a pharmacy. I didn't much feel like going with my grandma in the first place, but she couldn't leave me alone at home. We made our way out of the car and onto the sidewalk by the strip of shops where the pharmacy was. We entered the clothing store and my grandma started browsing while I stood and watched reluctantly. My grandma found something she liked and went to go try it on. I decided to be an irresponsible little kid and leave the store while she was trying on whatever it was she was trying on. I made my way around the corner into the pharmacy to go and look at toys in the hopes of asking my grandma to buy something when I heard a deep voice behind me say, Hey kid, do you want to come help me with something? I said no, of course. I may have been a naughty kid, but... I didn't simply trust a stranger. He kept asking me to help him with what he called a fun test or experiment or whatever he called it. I kept saying no and that I wouldn't go with him, but he grabbed my hand and tried to pull me toward the exit of the building. I resisted with all my might, but it didn't work. There, of course, wasn't anyone else in the store for whatever reason, so nobody could help me. This man that was trying to take me was probably in his mid-40s, it was a pretty big dude, so what happened next doesn't make much sense. My five foot two grandma walked into that store and shouted at him to leave me alone, and he got such a big fright that he almost fell over trying to run away. He could have probably easily trampled her, but for whatever reason, she genuinely scared him. I saw it in his eyes. I just thought of this story the other day while I was thinking of my grandma and how she was my hero as a kid. She passed away in 2017 of a heart attack. I know she's in a better place now. Moral of the story is that you should always keep close to your parent or guardian because you never know what kind of people are out there.
When I was around 17 years old, I was living in a really high floor in an apartment complex in southern Asia. On this particular school night, I was feeling really down to the point that I couldn't even fall asleep. So I decided to sit on my window bench seat and look down to the streets and the buildings around me while I was thinking about the things that were happening in my life. While I was looking numbed at the street, just remembering an incident that happened hours before, I started hearing movement from above me but I didn't pay much attention to it. I mean, someone who lives in an apartment complex is more than used to hearing noises from everywhere. But as minutes went by, the noise was starting to get louder and more intense. It was weird. The noise sounded like it was coming from outside the window, which was really strange since I lived on the 28th floor. And as you can imagine, nobody really stands outside a window on the 29th floor. Then I noticed that there was a lady by the window in the building in front of me. The thing that really got my attention is that it was around 3 in the morning by that time and the lady looked obviously very distressed. She looked like she was looking into my floor and I was not understanding why. Then it happened. At the same time I realized what was going on. I saw it. For less than a second I saw the distressed face of a man who had just jumped. I saw his body slowly fall 28 floors to his death. The thing that really shook me was the fact that it looked like his eyes were staring into mine, like he was surprised to find my eyes staring at him in the last moment of his life. It's been almost eight years since this incident happened. I don't even live in that city anymore, but still to this day, I never forgot the distressed man's cold and scared eyes looking into me. I will never forget the noise of the impact of his body when it hit the ground. Needless to say that in the two years that I lived in that city after that scarring incident, I never sat on that window bench again. This strange thing happened to me when I was about 11 or 12 years old. My school knew it happened. A few of my peers knew, but no one really talked about it afterwards. No one understood what happened, so they didn't tell my family or mention it to me again after that night. I think it just scared them so much that they just wanted to forget it happened, as did I. So this happened when my grade was on a school trip to our country's capital city. It was over a day's drive, so the school booked a large dorm of sorts for everyone to sleep in. It was one of those buildings where when you enter... The first room is huge, first the lounge room with the television and couches and all. Then the back of the large room was the dining area with about 20 of those long, fold-out tables. Then all along the left side, both on the floor level and second story, were the bedrooms which all contained bunk beds. You need to have an idea of the building layout for this story. So the night was relatively normal. We had dinner, played games, and went to bed. Now I had a top bunk in a room of eight girls... We chatted and gossiped as girls that age do before going to sleep. I remember falling asleep. Darkness, no dreams. Which is odd for me as I always have vivid dreams or nightmares, but this night nothing. Then I woke up. Cold, wet, on a hard surface. I open my eyes and I see the stars. I was outside of the building. I sit up and look around. I have been lying in a puddle of water directly outside of the building's entrance. At first I thought I was dreaming, but then I felt so incredibly cold I knew I couldn't be. I was so confused I just sat there for a few minutes processing everything. Eventually I managed to make myself stand and walk to the door to get back inside. The door was locked. I feel panic creeping up on me and I just start to cry. For some reason I didn't want to wake people to get back inside... Maybe I was scared of getting in trouble. For about 20 minutes, I tried to quietly wake up one of the girls in my room to let me in. But eventually, a teacher had heard me and rushed to the door. At this point, I was borderline hysterical, still trying not to make noise so as to not wake the other students. My teacher was terrified. She asked how I got out of the building, but I told her I didn't know. I just woke up out there. She woke up some of the other teachers and draped me in blankets to warm me. As I sit there, I can hear her talking to another teacher. She is saying that it would have been impossible for me to get out, 
The windows don't open. The keys to open all the doors are still where she hid them, exactly where they had been left. Even more concerning, there were about six students asleep on the couches in the living room, as there hadn't been enough beds right next to the entrance I woke up outside of. I couldn't have walked out myself without a key, nor could any other student. If they had, they would have needed to pass the students asleep there and unbolt this heavy, noisy door. The teachers spoke to those students in the morning. None of them heard anything or had been awoken by anything. One kid even admitted to being awake most of the night playing a game and hadn't seen me or anyone go outside until a teacher had retrieved me. The teacher spoke to the girls in my room. They said they too didn't see anyone come in or see me leave. The girl on the bottom of my bunk said she would have been woken up if I had due to the noisy nature of the bunks, but I did leave that bunk somehow. I did leave that building, and I don't know how. No one did. The school told my mother what happened. I couldn't explain it any more than the school could. She never let me go on another school trip again. I'm 25 now and am yet to have another event like this. I still to this day have no idea how I got outside, but just thinking about it sends shivers up my spine. I met Price when we were both in third grade. He was the quiet kid. He never talked to anyone except me unless he had to. He would get in trouble a lot, usually for small things that the teacher just got annoyed about. Price got bullied a lot for his height and his clothes. One time he backed out of a dare to lick the bathroom floor, which granted him a lot of terrible nicknames. It stuck for a while through elementary school, middle, and high school. He was a raggedy kid. Not just his appearance, but his attitude. He made everyone he spoke to feel like they had bathed in mud, but despite this, I took a liking to him. I always felt that I needed to protect him, no matter what. It wasn't until two years later in fifth grade that he had invited me to his house. He told me that he had lived in a trailer, so I assumed that he was in a trailer park, but that assumption was wrong. He told me that we could hang out at his place after school. I asked him if his parents would pick us up, but he told me he lived really close so we could just walk. He led me to the woods behind our school and we started walking. We must have been walking for ten minutes. By now the trees overhead blocked out the afternoon sun almost completely. We finally reached his home. It was a dirty trailer in the middle of the woods. No clearing, no road, and it seemed to have sunk into the ground. Vines and shrubbery had taken it over but the door and some windows had been cleared out. Price opened the door and it reeked of ganja, like a freight train. I walked in and the dirty carpet made a wet, squishy noise. Price assured me that it was probably just beer his dad had spilled. I had never been inside a trailer before, and my house was admittedly much larger than we needed it to be. It was always so clean and tidy. But I tried my best not to show any negative expression, despite the fact that I wanted to vomit. Price looked just like his dad. Long, greasy, blonde hair, a permanently upturned nose, and the eyes that bulged out of his head. His father seemed to be borderline catatonic due to being so stoned and drunk, he didn't even acknowledge my presence, and Price didn't acknowledge his. He led me to a room at the back of the trailer, with just a bed in it. He sat on the bed and pulled out a surprisingly pristine laptop, and I sat next to him. He showed me a video game that he made and all the coding that he's done. To my surprise, Price was a bit of a computer genius. For the next three years, I spent a lot of time with him in his trailer, mainly smoking and playing video games on the Xbox I bought him for his birthday in sixth grade. When high school came, we started to drift apart. I joined the football team and he wasn't too happy with that. Price got really jealous about my other friends and this is when things really started to go downhill. After not talking for a few months, Price texted me about a problem with his dad. I got to his trailer and from outside I heard drunken screaming from his father. I barged into the trailer to see Price's dad beating him almost to death. I tried to stop him but things got rough and I pushed his dad into a cabinet. He fell over and busted his head on a corner of the kitchen counter. 
I drove him to the hospital and left him there so we wouldn't get in any trouble for accidentally hurting him. But me and Price knew that his dad was more than just hurt. We found out that he had died in the hospital. I thought Price would be relieved to be rid of his abusive father, but he wasn't. We didn't speak after that, and I think he blames me for his father's death, but I think it's really Price's fault. In my sophomore year, six members of the football team went missing. The only connection they had other than being on the same team was that they were the only ones on the team that went to the same elementary and middle school as Price and I. This is the same day that Price went missing. A few days later, a package showed up at my front doorstep. It was in a cardboard box, sloppily sealed in duct tape. Inside was a laptop. It was Price's laptop. I opened it up and it was unlocked and already turned on. On the screen was what appeared to be a title screen for a video game. I couldn't click out of it. I couldn't access Task Manager. I couldn't even turn the computer off. All I could do was click the red button in the middle of the screen that read Start in big bold letters. The game played a bit like Slender Man. If you're not familiar with it, it's a game where you roam the woods searching for pages of a notebook while being chased by a demon in a suit. Except the game Price made was in the high school. In fact, it was an exact replica of the school. And I wasn't being chased by anything to my knowledge, although I constantly felt like I was being watched. I found the first item. It was a well-drawn piece of a photo that had been torn off. It appeared to be an arm. A prompt in the upper right corner of the screen read, One sixth piece is found. The game took me about 20 minutes to finish. Each piece I found was a different body part. Two legs, two arms, a torso, and lower body. I noticed that in the picture with the lower body, the genitals had been ripped off. A new prompt told me to go out to the football field and find the final piece. Lying in the middle of the field was the last piece of the picture. It was the head of one of the missing football players. I put the pieces together and I stared at the completed picture. The picture wasn't drawn. It was a real picture that Price had imported into the game. The whole picture showed a mosaic of different body parts ripped from each missing player that had been sewn together. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. All of a sudden the game closed out and then the screen showed a picture of me in my room huddled over my desk. The picture had been taken from outside my window. Had Price been stalking me? My breath quaked. I was sitting so still for so long that my back started to hurt. So while I figured out what I should do about this information that had been forced upon me, I leaned back in my chair. One last terrifying realization settled on my shoulders. When I leaned back in my chair, the me that was in the picture leaned back as well. It's not a picture, I thought to myself. It was a live feed from outside my window. I frantically looked outside, but it was too dark to see anything. I was going to go out and try to see where the camera was, but when I looked back at the computer, it just read, no signal. It's now my senior year in college. The police never found Price or any of the football players. The mosaic of limbs was found right in the middle of the football field where it had been in the video game. I never told anyone about the game or the live feed from outside my window. Every year, three days after the anniversary of Price's disappearance, I get a package in the mail. It's always a laptop with a live video feed of me in my bedroom. They have followed me wherever I move to. I have grown attached to the packages. I have kept each laptop. None of them work except for the live feed. So I have decided to hang each one on my wall. I never look for the camera. I just sit and smile, knowing that that raggedy kid is still watching over me. Today is the anniversary of his disappearance. So should I expect another laptop in the mail soon? And when I get it, I will repeat my yearly tradition of watching the live feed. I don't feel guilty about what I did. It serves them right for bullying my best friend. Thirty hours ago, I hopped on a late night flight from New York heading to Los Angeles. After boarding, I saw that I had an entire road to myself. Takeoff passed without incident, and soon I was stretched out for a nap across the row. 
I slept for a few hours, I don't know how long, but I woke up to some severe turbulence. It's possible that the lights in the cabin went out for a moment, but I was so disoriented that it's hard to say. I checked my phone to see that it was 4.03 a.m., which I figured gave me about an hour until we landed. When I looked out my window, I was shocked to see nothing but wide open ocean. My jaw dropped. There's obviously no ocean between New York and Los Angeles. I hit the button to call the flight attendant and spent the next few minutes racking my brain for a lake that could have been possibly big enough to explain what I was seeing. I jumped when the attendant flipped off the light. She was grinning from ear to ear and tears were pouring down her cheeks. How can I help you, sir? She asked. I froze for a moment at her reaction before deciding to just ask my question. Where are we? Why does it look like we're flying over an ocean? She wiped her cheeks to clear the tears, still grinning wildly. Sir, we'll be landing in about an hour. I, uh, okay, thank you, I said. After she left, I checked the clock on my phone again. 4.03 a.m. blinked back at me. It hadn't changed. I had to have been waiting with my call light on for at least five minutes. How was it possible that it hadn't changed at all? I opened up my laptop and saw that it too displayed 4.03 a.m. I pulled out my phone, started a stopwatch in the app, and spent the next two hours looking back and forth between the clocks, waiting for them to change. They never did. I tapped the shoulder of an older woman sitting in the row ahead of me. She looked back, an annoyed expression across her face. Yes, she asked. Do you know how long until we land? I asked. She narrowed her eyes. That flight attendant said it would be about another hour. I shook my head in confusion. That flight attendant? We talked almost two hours ago. We should have landed already. She stared at me as if I was crazy. I was going to continue trying to convince her, but I felt a hand on my shoulder. I spun to see a male flight attendant grinning down at me, tears pinging off his cheeks onto my shoulder. Sir, I'm going to ask you to calm down, or I'll be calling the captain. I told him that wouldn't be necessary and sat back. He removed his hand and stepped away. The flight attendants continued to stop by every few hours offering meals. My stopwatch continued to tick up and is now telling me that I've been on this plane for more than 30 hours. I've explored all of coach and tried talking to some other passengers, but they've all told me that they're expecting to land in an hour or so. Around three hours back, I tried getting into first class. I made it past the curtain, but was escorted back by two grinning flight attendants. Their grip on my arms were like iron. Sir, the seatbelt sign is on, one said. Please remain in your seat with your buckle fastened. We'll be landing in about an hour. I had just about given up hope when a woman came down the aisle dressed in a business suit. She didn't look at me or slow down, but she dropped a piece of paper onto my tray as she made her way to the bathrooms at the back of the plane. I shot a look around before unrolling it. It said, are you stuck too? I pulled out a pen and wrote, yes, it's been 30 hours. I folded the scrap of paper up and set it on the tray closest to the aisle. She left the bathroom and picked it up as she passed. It's been 20 minutes since then. I don't know why, but I don't think the flight attendants would like it if they knew we were talking. It doesn't matter. I have to do something. I'll update you all on my channel with whatever happens next. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.